Part Two of Hockenheimer of Cincinnati by Fanny Hurst. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Good evening, Easy. Isadore Schongott paused in the act of mounting the front steps and turned a blood-driven face toward his neighbor. His underjaw sagged and trembled, and his well-knit body seemed to have lost its power to stand erect, so that his clothes bagged. "'Good evening, Mrs. Lissman. "'You're home early tonight, Izzy?' "'Yes.' He fitted his key into the front door lock, but his hand trembled so that it would not turn, and for a racking moment he stood there vainly, pushing a weak knee against the panel, and his breath came out of his throat in a wheeze. The maid of all work, straggly and down at the heels, answered his fumbling at the lock and opened the door to him. You, Mr. Izzy? He sprang in like a catamount, clicking the door quick as a flash behind him. Shh! Where's Ma? Your mamma ain't home. She went up to Rindley's. You ain't sick, are you, Mr. Izzy? A spasm of relief flashed over his face, and he snapped his dry fingers in an agony of nervousness. Where's Rennie? Quick. She's in her room, laying down. She ain't got to be home to the supper party tonight, Mr. Izzy. She... What's the matter, Mr. Izzy? He was down the hallway in three running bounds, and without the preliminary of knocking into his sister's tiny, semi-darkened bedroom, his breathing suddenly filling him. She sprang from her little chintz-covered bed, where she had flung herself across its top, her face and wrapper rumpled with sleep. Izzy! Shh! Izzy! What? Where? Izzy! What is it? Shh! For God's sake! Shh! Don't let him hear, Rennie. Don't let him hear. Her swimming senses suddenly seemed to clear. What's happened, Izzy? Quick, what's wrong? He clicked the key in the lock, and, in the agony of the same dry-fingered nervousness, rubbed his hand back and forth across his dry lips. Don't let him hear. The old man, or Ma, don't. Quick, what is it, Izzy? She sat down on the edge of the bed week. Tell me, Izzy, something terrible is wrong. It, it isn't Papa, Izzy. Tell me it isn't Papa. For God's sake, Izzy, he, he ain't. Shh, N no, no, it ain't it. It, it ain't Papa. It's me, Rainy. It's me. He crumbled at her feet, his palms plastered over his eyes, and his fingers clutched deep in the high nap of his hair. It's me. It's me. What? What? Shh. For God's sake, Rainy. You got to stand by me. You got to stand by me this time if you ever did. Promise me, Rainy. It's me, Rainy. I... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. She stooped to his side, her voice and hands trembling beyond control. Izzy. Izzy. Tell me. Tell me. What is it? Oh, my God. Why didn't I die? Why didn't I die? Izzy, what? What is it? Money? Haven't I always stood by you before? Won't I now? Tell me, Izzy. Tell me, I say. She tugged at his hands, prying them away from his eyes, but the terror she saw there set her trembling again, and thrice she opened her lips before she found voice. Izzy, if you don't tell me, Mama will be back soon, and then Pa, and you better tell me quick. Your own sister will stand by you. Get up, dearie. Tears trickled through his fingers, and she could see the curve of his back rise and fall to the retching of suppressed sobs. Izzy, you got to tell me quick. Do you hear? He raised his ravaged face at the sharp-edged incisiveness in her voice. I'm in trouble, Rainy. Such trouble. Oh, my God, such horrible trouble. Tell me quick, do you hear? Quick, or Mama and Papa. Rainy, shh, they mustn't know. The old man mustn't. She mustn't. If, if I got to kill myself first. His heart, he, he mustn't. Rainy, he mustn't know. Know what? 
It's all up, Rainy. I've done something, the worst thing I ever done in my life. But I didn't know while I was doing it, Rainy, how, what it was. I swear I didn't. It was like borrowing, I thought. I was sure I could pay it back. I thought the system was a great one, and, and I couldn't lose. Izzy, roulette again? You, you've been losing at, at roulette again? No, no, but they found out at, at the bank. Rainy, I, oh my God, nothing won't save me. The bank, Izzy? They found out, Rainy, yesterday when the bank was closed, he, Uncle Isidore, put him on the books. Nothing won't save me now, Rainy. He won't. You, you know him, hard as nails. Nothing won't save me. It's going to be stripes for me, Rainy. Ma, the old man, stripes. I, I can't let him do it. I, I'll kill myself first. I can't let him. I can't, I can't let him. He burrowed his face in her lap to stifle his voice, which slipped up and away from his control. And her icy hands and knees could feel his entire body trembling. Shh, dearie, try to tell me slow, dearie, for Pa's and Ma's sake, so, so we can fix it up somehow. We can't fix it up. The old man ain't got the money, and, and he can't stand it. For God's sake, Izzy, tell me, or I'll go mad. Slow, dearie, so Rainy can think and listen and help you. She's with you, darling, and nothing can hurt you. Now begin, Izzy, and go slow. What did you start to tell me about Uncle Isidore and the books? Slow, darling. Her voice was smooth and flowing, and the hand that stroked his hair was slow and soothing. The great stream of his passion abated, and he huddled quietly at her feet. Now begin, dearie. Uncle Isidore, what? This morning, when I got down to, to the office, two men had my books. Yes? Oh, God, when I seen them, right away my heart just stopped. Shh. Yes, two men had the books. And Uncle Isidore, Uncle Isidore, he was, he... Go on. He, he was in the cage, too. And, and you know how he looks when his eyes get little. Yes, yes, Izzy. They were expert accountants with him. All day yesterday, Sunday, they were on my books. And, and they had me, Rainy. They had me like a rat in a trap. Had you, Izzy? He drew himself upward clutching at her arms, and the sobs began to tear him afresh. They had me, Rainy. Oh, Izzy, why? I could have paid it back. I could have put it back if the old skinflint hadn't got to sniffing round and sicked them on my books. I could have won it all back in time, Rainy, with my own uncle, my own mother's brother. It, it wasn't like I was stealing it, was it, Rainy? Was it? Oh, my God, Izzy. It wasn't, Rainy. My own uncle. I could have won it back if, if... One back what, Izzy? One back what? I, I started with a hundred, Rainy. I had to have it. I had to, I tell you. You remember that night? I, I wanted you to go over and ask Aunt Beck for it. I had to have it. Pa, I, I couldn't excite him any more about it, and, and I had to have it. I tell you, Rainy. Yes, then what? And I, I borrowed it without asking. I, I fixed it on my book so, so Uncle Isidore wouldn't, couldn't. I, I fixed it on my books. Oh, oh, Izzy. Oh, oh. Oh, I was trying out a system, a new one, and it worked, Rainy. I tried it out on the new wheel down at Sharky's, and the 17 system worked like a trick. 
I won big the first and second nights, Rainy. You remember the night I brought you and Ma the bracelets? I paid back the hundred the first week, Rainy, and no one knew. No one knew. Ah. The next Friday, my luck turned on me. I never ought to have played on Friday. Turned like a toad one unlucky Friday night. I got in deep before I knew it, and deeper, and deeper, and then... And then it just seemed there wasn't no holding me raining. I got wild, got wild, I tell you. And I, I wrote um checks. I didn't have no right to write. I, I went crazy, I tell you. Next day, you remember that morning I left the house so early? I had to fix it with the books and borrow what, what I needed before the banks opened. I, I had to make good on them checks raining. I fixed it with the books, and from that time on, it worked. Oh, Izzy, Izzy, Izzy. I kept losing, Rainy. But I knew if my luck just changed from that unlucky Friday night, I could pay it back like the first time. All I needed was a little time and a little luck, and I could pay it back like the first hundred. So I kept fixing my books, Rainy, and, and borrowing more and more. How much? Oh, God, Rainy, I could have paid it back with time. I... Shh. How much is he? How much? Somebody must have snitched on me. How I was losing every night. The old skinflit, he... Oh, my God. They got me, Rainy. They got me. And it'll kill the old man. How much is he? How much? Oh, my God. I could have paid it back. If, if, how much? Tell me, I say. Four thousand. Oh, Izzy, Izzy, Izzy. She sprang back from him, blind with scalding tears. Izzy, four thousand. Oh, my God, four thousand. I could have paid it back, Rainy. The system was all right, but four thousand. Four thousand. He... He was all for detaining me right away, Rainy, sending for Pa, and, and sicking the law right on his, his own sister's son. On my knees, for three hours I had to beg, Rainy, on my knees, for Ma's sake, and your sake, and Pa's. Just for a little time I begged. A little time was all I begged. He don't care nothing for blood. I, I had to beg him, Rainy, till, till I fainted. What shall we do, Izzy? What shall we do? I squeeze two weeks' time out of him, Rainy. Two weeks to pay it back, or he puts the law on me. Two weeks. I got it from him like blood from a turnip. Oh, my God, Rainy. Four thousand and two weeks. Four thousand and two weeks. He fell in a half swoon against her skirts. Out of her arms she made a pillow of mercy and drew his head down to her bosom and tears, bitter with salt, mingled with his, and her heart's blood buzzed in her brain. Izzy, Izzy, what have you done? I can't pay it back, Rainy. Where could I get half that much? I can't pay back four dollars, much less four thousand. I can't, I can't. Four thousand? We gotta keep it from the old man and Ma, Rainy. Let him kill me if they want to, but we gotta keep it from him and Ma. Four thousand. Four thousand! In the half-light of the room, with the late sunshine pressing warm against the drawn green shades, the remote shouts of children coming to them through the quiet, and the whir of a lawnmower off somewhere, they crouched, these two, as though they would shut their ears to the flapping of vultures' wings. They can't do anything to you, Izzy. What'll we do, Rainy? What'll we do? We got to find a way, Izzy. They can't send me up for it, Rainy. Say they can't. No, no, dear. I ain't crooked like that. It was my own uncle. They can't send me up, Rainy. I'll kill myself first. I'll kill myself first. Izzy, ain't you ashamed? But it was as though the odor of death found its way to her nostrils, nauseating her. Let me think. Let me think just a minute. Let me think. 
She rammed the ends of her fists tight against her eyes until Catherine wheels spun and spun against her lids. Let me think just a minute. There's nobody, Rainy. Nobody. Nobody. No way. Four thousand. Nobody, I tell you, Rainy. But I'll kill myself before I... Rainy stood up. Izzy, I will. He was whimpering frankly against her skirt. After a while, she raised her face. Jeanne d'Arc might have looked like that when she beheld the vision. Squash! What? Squash! It's like he was sent out of heaven. He... he ain't. He's coming tonight to ask me, is he? You know what I mean? Don't you see? Don't you see? I... don't you see, Izzy? He's going to ask me, and... and I'm going to do it. Oh, my God, Rainy, you can't do that for me. You can't do that for me. He's got it, Izzy. I can get ten thousand out of him if I got to. But, Rainy... I... I can rush it through and... do it before two weeks, Izzy. And we got a way out, Izzy. We got a way. We got a way. She threw herself in a passion of hysteria face downward on the bed, and a tornado of weeping swept over her. Rooted, he stood as though face to face with an immense dawn, but with eyes that dared not see the light. Rainy, I can't. I, Rainy, I can't let you do that for me. If, if, I can't let you marry him for me. If you don't, shh. Mrs. Shongut's voice outside the door, querulous. Rainy! Silence. Rainy! Yes, Mama. What you got your door locked? Silence. Huh? I... I... Come right away out in the dining room. If you ain't got no more regards for your parents than not to stay home for supper. Anyways, you got to fix for the table the flowers what I brought home from market yes mamma she darted to her feet drying the tears on her cheeks with the palm of her hand coming mamma and she slipped through the door of her room scarcely opening it in the dining room beside the white spread table mrs shongut unwound a paper toot of pink carnations but the flavor of her spirit was bitter and her thin pressed-looking lips hung at the corners Maybe you can stop pouting long enough to help with things a little, even if you won't be here. I tell you, it's a pleasure when Papa comes home for supper with company to have children like mine. Listen, Mama, I... Sounds like somebody's going out of the house, Rainy. Who? No, no, no one has been here, Mama. It's just the breeze. I tell you, it's a pleasure to have a daughter like mine. What excuses to make to Max Hockenheimer, a young man what comes all the way from Cincinnati to see her? Listen, Mama, I, I've i only been fooling. Honest, I have. What? I... Ah, Mama. Miss Shongut's face was suddenly buried in the neat lace yoke of her mother's dimity blouse, and her arms crept up about her neck. I've been only fooling about tonight, Mama. Don't you think I know it is just like he was sent from heaven? I've only been fooling, Mama, so that, so that you shouldn't know how happy I am. The soul peeped out suddenly in Mrs. Shongut's face, hollowing it. Rainy, my little Rainy. On Wasserman Avenue, the hand the rocks the cradle, oftener than not carves the roast. Behind her platter, sovereign of all she surveyed, and skillfully, so that beneath her steel the red, oozing slices curled and fell into their pool of gravy, reigned Mrs. Shongut, and her suzerainty rested on her as lightly as a tiara of seven stars. Mr. Hockenheimer, you ain't eating a thing. Mrs. Shongut craned her neck round the centerpiece of pink carnations. Not a thing on your plate? Rainy, pass Mr. Hockenheimer some more salad. No, no, Mrs. Shongut. Just don't you worry about me. I hope you ain't bashful, Mr. Hockenheimer. We feel toward you just like home folks. Indeed, what I don't 
see I ask for, Mrs. Shongut. Rainy, pass Mr. Hockenheimer some more of that red cabbage. No, no, please, Mrs. Shongut, I got plenty. Ah, Mr. Hockenheimer, you eat so little you must be in love. Mama! Ah, Mr. Hockenheimer knows that I only fool. Rainy, pass the dumplings. No, no, please, I... Mama, don't force. You're not bashful, are you, Mr. Hockenheimer? Miss Shongut inclined her head with a saucy, bird-like motion, and showed him the full, gleaming line of her teeth. He took a large mouthful of ice water to wash down the red of confusion that suddenly swam high in his face, tinging even in his ears. For more dumplings I ain't bashful, Miss Rennie. But there, there's other things I am bashful to ask for. From his place, at the far end of the table, Mr. Shongut laughed deep, as though a spiral spring was vibrating in the recesses of his throat. Bashful with girls, eh, Hockenheimer? I ain't much of a ladies' man, Shongut. Well, I wish you was just so bashful in business. Believe me, I wish you was. Shongut, I never got the best of you yet in a deal. With my girl, he's bashful yet, Mama. But down to the last sausage casing, I have to pay his fancy prices. None. Look, Mama, how red she gets. What you get so red for, Annie, eh? Ah, oh, Papa. A little teasing from her old father she can't take. Look at her, Mama. Look at both of them, red like beets. Neither of them can stand a little teasing from an old man. Adolf, you mustn't. All people don't like it when you make fun. Mr. Hockenheimer, you must excuse my husband. A great one he is to tease and make his little fun. Mr. Shongut's ancient-looking face, covered with a short grizzled growth of beard and pale as a prophet's beneath, broke into a smile, and a minute network of lines sprang out from the corners of his eyes. I was bashful in my life once, too. Eh, Mama? Papa. Please, you must excuse my husband, Mr. Hockenheimer. He likes to have his little jokes. Mr. Hockenheimer pushed away his plate in high embarrassment, nor would his eyes meet Miss Shongut's, except to flash away under cover of exaggerated imperturbability. My husband's a great one to tease Mr. Hockenheimer. My Izzy, too, takes after him. I'm sorry that boy ain't home, so you could meet him again. We call him the dude of the family. Rainy, pass Mr. Hockenheimer the toothpicks. A pair of deep, lined brackets sprang out round Mr. Shongut's mouth. Why ain't that boy home for supper, where he belongs? Ach, now, Adolf, don't get excited right away. Always, Mr. Hockenheimer, my husband gets excited over nothing when he knows how it hurts his heart. Like that boy ain't old enough to stay out to supper when he wants. Adolf, shh. Mrs. Shongut smiled to conceal that her heart was faint, and the saga of a mother might have been written round that smile. Now, now, Adolf, don't you begin to worry. I tell you, Shongut, it's a mistake to worry. I save all my excitement for the good things in life. See, Adolf, from a young man like Mr. Hockenheimer, you can get pointers. I tell you, Shongut, over such a nice little home and such a nice little family as you've got, I might get excited. But over the little things that don't count for much, I ain't got time. Mrs. Shongut waved a deprecatory hand. It's a nice enough little home for us, Mr. Hockenheimer, but with a grand house like I hear you built for your mother up on the stylish hilltop in Cincinnati, I guess to you it seems right plain. That's where you are wrong, Mrs. Shongut. Like a sister Shongut coming out on the street car with him tonight, if it hadn't been that I thought maybe my mother would like a little fanciness after a hard life like hers, for my own part, a little house and a big garden is all I ask for. Ah, Mr. Hockenheimer, with such a grand house like that is sunk in baths, Mrs. Schwartz says you got. To see a house like that, I tell you, it must be a treat. 
It's a fine place, Mrs. Shongut, but too big for me and my mother. When I got into the hands of architects, let me tell you, I feel I was lucky to get off with only twenty-five rooms. Right now, Mrs. Shongut, we got rooms we don't know how to pronounce. Twenty-five rooms. Did you hear that, Adolf? Twenty-five rooms. I bet, Mr. Hockenheimer, your mother is proud of such a son as can give her twenty-five rooms. We don't say much about it to each other, my mother and me, but you can believe me or not, in our big stylish house up there on the hill, with her servants to take away from her all the pleasure of work, and her market, and old friends down on Richmond Street yet, and nothing but gold furniture around her, she gets lonesome enough. If it wasn't for my garden and the beautiful scenery from my terraces, I would wish myself back in our little downtown house more than once, too. I tell you, Mrs. Shongut, fineness ain't everything. You should bring your mother some time to Mound City with you when you come over on business, Mr. Hockenheimer. We would do our best to make it pleasant for her. She's an old woman, Mrs. Shongut, and in a train or an automobile I can't get her. I guess it would be better, Mrs. Shongut, if I carry off some of your family with me to Cincinnati. And to Bell, that his words had any glittering import, he lay back in his chair in a state of silent laughter, which set his soft flesh cheeks a-quiver, and his blue eyes, so ready yet so reluctant, disappeared behind a tight squint. Adolf, I guess Mr. Hockenheimer will excuse us, say, Rainy. You can entertain Mr. Hockenheimer while me and Papa go and spend the evening over at Aunt Mina's. Mr. Shongut's sister, Mr. Hockenheimer, ain't been so well. Anyways, I always say young folks ain't got no time for old ones. You go right ahead along, Mrs. Shongut. Don't treat me like company. I hope Miss Rainey don't mind if I spend the evening. I should say not. Hockenheimer, a cigar? Thanks, I don't smoke. My husband, with his heart trouble, shouldn't smoke neither, Mr. Hockenheimer. It worries me enough. What me and the doctors tell him goes in one ear and out the other. See, Hockenheimer, when you get a wife, how henpecked you get? A henpeck never drew much blood, Shongut. Come, Adolf, it is a long car ride to Mina's. They pushed back from the table, the four of them, smiling-lipped. With his short-fingered, hairy-backed hands, Mr. Hockenheimer dusted at his coat lapels, then shook his bulging trousers' knees into place. The lamp of inner sanctity burns in strange temples. A carpenter in haircloth shirt first turned men's hearts outward. Who can know? Who does not first cross the plain of the guide with gold? that behind the moldy panels at Ara Coeli reigns the jeweled bambino, robed in the glittering gems of sacrifice. Who could know, as Mr. Hockenheimer stood there in the curtailed dignity of his five feet six, that behind his speckled and slightly rotund waistcoat a choir sang of love, and that the white flame of his spirit burned high? I tell you, Mrs. Shongut, it is a pleasure to be invited out to your house. You should know how this old bachelor hates hotels. And you should know how welcome you always are, Mr. Hockenheimer. Tomorrow night you take supper with us, too. We don't take no, eh, Adolf, Rennie? I appreciate that, Mrs. Shongut, but I, I don't know yet. If, if I stay over, Mr. Shongut battered a playful hand and shuffled toward the door. You stay, Hockenheimer. I bet you a good cigar you stay. Ain't I right, Rainey, that he stays? Ain't I right? Against the sideboard, fingering her white dress, Miss Shongut regarded her parents, and her smile was as wan as moonlight. Ain't I right, Rainey? Yes, Papa. On the bed of porch, the hall light carefully lowered and, and cushions from within spread at their feet. The dreamy quiet of evening and air, as soft as milk, flowed round and closed in about Miss Shongut and Mr. Hockenheimer. 
They drew their rocking chairs arm to arm, so that, behind a bit of climbing moonflower vine, they were as snug as in a bower. Stars shone over the roofs of the houses opposite. The shouts of children had died down. Crickets whirred. Is the light from that street lamp in your eyes, Rainy? No, no. The wooden floor reverberated as they rocked. A little thrill of breeze fluttered her filmy shoulder scarf against his hand. To his fermenting fancy, it was as though her spirit had flitted out of the flesh. Ah, Miss Rainy, I, I. What, Mr. Hockenheimer? Nothing. Your, your little shawl, it tickled my hand so. She leaned her elbow on the arm of her chair and cupped her chin in her palm. Her eyes had a peculiar value, like a mill pond, when the wheel is still, reflects the stars in calm and unchurned quiet. You look just like a little princess tonight, Miss Rainey, that pretty shawl and your eyes so bright. A princess? Yes. If I had a tin suit and a sword to match, I'd ride up on a horse and carry you off to my castle in Cincinnati. Say, wouldn't it be a treat for Wasserman Avenue to see me go loping off like that? This is the first little visit we've ever had together all by ourselves, ain't it, Miss Rainey? Seems like, to a bashful fellow like me, you was always slipping away from me. The flowers and the candies you kept sending me were grand, Mr. Hockenheimer, and the letter today. You read the letter, Miss Rainey? Yes, I, I, you shouldn't keep spoiling me with such grand flowers and candy, Mr. Hockenheimer. If tell you that never in my life I sent flowers or candy or wrote a letter like I wrote you yesterday to another young lady, I guess you laugh at me. Not, Miss Rainey? You shouldn't begin, Mr. Hockenheimer, by spoiling me. Ah, Miss Rainey, if you knew how I like to spoil you, if you would let me. Ah, what's the use? I, I can't say it like I want. She could hear him breathing. It's, it's a grand night, Miss Rainey. Yes. Grand. And look over those roofs. It seems like there's a million stars shining, don't it? You're like me, Miss Rainey. So many times I've noticed it. Nothing is so grand to me as nature, neither. Up at Green Springs in the Ozarks, where we went for ten days last summer, honest, Mr. Hockenheimer, I used to lie looking out the window all night. The stars up there shone so close it seemed like you could nearly touch them. Ain't that wonderful, Miss Rainey? You should be just like me again. She smiled in the dark. When I was a boy always next to the attic window, I liked to sleep. When I built my house, Miss Rainey, the first thing after I designed my rose garden, I drew up for myself a sleeping garden on my roof. The architects fussed enough about spoiling the roof line, but that's one of the things I wanted, which I stood pat for and got, my sleeping garden. Sleeping garden? Miss Rainey, I just wish you could see it, all laid out in roses in summer, and a screened-in pergola where I sleep, right under the stars and roses. I sleep so close to heaven, I always say I can smell it. She turned her little face, white as a spray of jasmine against a dark background of night, toward him. Underneath a pergola of roses, I guess it's the roses you must smell. How grand! Sometimes when, if you come to Cincinnati, I want to show you my place, Miss Rainey, if I say so myself, I got a wonderful garden, flowers I can show you grown from clippings from every part of the world. If I do say so, for a sausage maker who never went to school two years in his life, it ain't so bad. I got a lily pond, Miss Rainey. They come from all over to see. By myself I designed it. It must be grand, Mr. Hockenheimer. On Sunday... Miss Rainey, I like for my boys and girls from the factory to come up to my place and make themselves at home. You should see my old mother, how she fixes for them. I wish you could see them boys and girls, and old men and women. In a sausage factory, they don't get much time to listen to birds in water when it falls into a fountain. I wish, Miss Rainey, you could see them with the flowers. I, 
Well, I don't know how to say it, but I wish you could see them for yourself. They like it? Like it? I tell you it's the greatest pleasure I get out of my place. I wish, instead of my fine house, the city would let me build my factory for them right in the garden. On such a stylish street they wouldn't ever let you, Mr. Hockenheimer. Me and my mother ain't much for style, Miss Rainey. Honest, you'd be surprised, but with my fine house I don't even keep an automobile. My mother, she's old, Miss Rainey, and won't go in one. Alone it ain't no pleasure, and when I don't walk down to my factory the streetcars is good enough. You should take it easier, Mr. Hockenheimer. All our lives, Miss Rainey, we've been so busy, my mother and me. I tell her we got to be learnt, like children got to be learnt to walk, how to enjoy ourselves. We, we need somebody young, somebody like you in the house, Miss Rainey, young and so pretty and full of life and, and so sweet. She gave a gauzy laugh. <laughs> Honest, it must seem like a dream to have a rose garden right on the place you live. I wish you could see, Miss Rainey, a new Killarney my gardener showed me in the hothouse yesterday before I left. White and pink blend. He got the clipping from Jamaica. It's a pale pink in the heart, like the first minute when the sun rises, and then it gets pinker and pinker toward the outside petals, till it just bursts out as red as the sun when it's ready to set. And those beautiful little tan roses you sent me, Mr. Hockenheimer, I... Ah, Miss Rainey, the clipping from those sunset roses comes from Italy. But now I call them rainy roses, if, if you'll excuse me. I tell you, Miss Rainey, you look just enough like em to be related. Little satiny gold-looking roses, with a pink blush on the inside of the petals, and a, a few little soft thorns on the stem. Ah, Mr. Hockenheimer, I ain't got thorns. Out from the velvet shadows his face came closer. It's thorns to me, Miss Rainey, because you're so pretty and sweet, and, and seem so far away from a plain fellow like me. I, I'm a plain man, Miss Rainey, and I don't know how to talk much about the things I feel inside of me, but, but I feel all righty. Looks ain't everything. I tell you, Miss Rainey, now, since I can afford it, I just don't seem to know how to do the things I got the feeling inside of me for. Even in my grand house sometimes I feel like it. It's too late for me to live like I feel. Nothing's ever too late, Mr. Hockenheimer. Just since I met you, I can feel that way, Miss Rainey, if you'll excuse me for saying it. Just since I met you. Me? For the first time in my life, Miss Rainey, I got the feeling from a girl that, for me, life, maybe my life, is just beginning. Like a vine, Miss Rainey, you got yourself tangled around my feelings. Oh, Mr. Hockenheimer, like I told your papa tonight on the car, I ain't got much to offer a beautiful young girl like you. Money, I can see, don't count for so much with a fine girl like you, and I... I don't need to be told that my face and my ways ain't my fortune. It's the heart that counts, Mr. Hockenheimer. If, if you mean that, Miss Rainey, if love, just love, can bring happiness, I can make for you a life as beautiful as my rose garden. For the first time in my life, Miss Rainey, I got the feeling I can do that for a woman, and that woman is you. I... Will you, will you be my wife, Miss Rainey? She could feel his breath now, scorching her cheek. Will you, Miss Rainey? And even as she leaned over to open her lips, a figure, swift as a Greek, dashed to the veranda, up the steps, three at a bound. Rainey! Izzy! She rose, pushing back her chair, and her hands flew to her breast. Just a minute. Inside I gotta see you quick, Rainey. Howdy, Hockenheimer. You excuse her a minute? I got to see her. His voice was like wine that sings in the pouring. Yes, yes, Izzy, I'm coming. 
Hers was a trembling and pizzicato. Excuse me a minute, Mr. Hockenheimer. A minute. Mr. Hockenheimer rose, mopping his brow. It's all right, Miss Rainey. I wait out here on the porch till it pleases you. In her tiny bedroom, with the light turned up, she faced her brother, and he grasped her shoulders so that, through the sheer texture of her dress, his hands left red prints on the flesh. Rainy, you ain't done it, have you? No. No, Izzy. I've done nothing. Where you been? He gave a great laugh and sank into a chair, limp. You don't have to, Rainy. It's all right. I've fixed it. Everything is all right. What do you mean? Then, as though the current of his returning vigor could know no bounds, he scooped her in a one-armed embrace that fairly raised her from the floor. All of a sudden, when you went out, Rainy, I remembered Aunt Becky. You remember she was the one who made Uncle Isidore fork over to Papa that time about the mortgage? Yes, yes. All of a sudden it came over me that she was the only one who could do anything with him. I ran over to the house. All the way I ran, Rainy. She was up in her room, and, and it's all right, Rainy. I told her, and she's fixed it. Fixed it. Oh, Izzy. She's fixed it. When he came home to supper, we got him right away up in her room before he had his hat off. Like a mother, she begged for me. Rainy. Like a mother. God, I, I tell you, I couldn't go through it again. But she got him, Rainy. She got him. Go on, Izzy. Go on. She told him I wouldn't face the shame. She told him I, I'd kill my own father and that the blood would be on his hands. She told him if he'd let me go to the devil without another chance, me that had been named after him, that a curse would roost on his chest. He didn't want to give in to her. He didn't want to, but she scared him. And she's a woman, and she knew how to get inside of him. She knew how. They're going to send me out to his mines, where I can start over, Rainy, out west, where it'll make a new man of me, where I can begin over. Start right, Rainy. Start right. Oh, Izzy, darling, I can pay up when I earn the money like a man, Rainy. It would have killed me if you had sold yourself to him for me. I'd have gone to the stripes first, but I got a man's chance now, Rainy, and I don't have to do that rotten thing to you and squash. A man's chance, Rainy, and, and I'm going to take it. She sat down on the bed suddenly, as though the blood had flowed out of her heart, weakening her. A sister like you that would have stuck, and, and I'm going to make good to a sister like you, Rainy. I am this time. Please believe me, Rainy. I am. I am. Her hand lay pressed to his cheek, and she could feel the warm course of his tears. Izzy, I knew you wasn't yellow. I, I knew you wasn't. Sobs shook him suddenly, and he buried his face in the pillow beside her. Why, Izzy, why, Izzy, darling, what, what is it, Izzy, darling? It's nothing. You, you get out, Rainy. I'm all right. Only, only it's, it's, now that it's all over, I, I, just, just let me alone a minute, Rainy. Go, you, please, please. She closed the door behind her and fumbled through the gloom of the hallway, her hand faltering as she groped ahead. From the recesses of the moonflower vine, Mr. Hockenheimer rose to meet her, and, because her limbs would tremble, she slid quickly into her chair. You, you must excuse me, Mr. Hockenheimer. It's all right, Miss Rainey. I take up where we left off. It ain't so easy, Miss Rainey, to begin all over again to say it. But, but, will you be my, will you be my... She was suddenly in his arms, burrowing against the speckled waistcoat, a little resting place for her head end of part two end of hockheimer of cincinnati by fanny hurst